Today we are going back to the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So sit back as we go to England. Samuel Herbert Dougal was born in May 1846 in the East End of London. His father was a builder and worked hard to provide for his family and made sure that Samuel went to school. He proved to be quite a good student, but at 14 years old, he finished his education when he secured an apprenticeship at a civil engineering company. He stayed working for the company until March 1866, when he suddenly left. Some of his colleagues thought it strange that he had decided to leave, but Samuel had ambitions to join the army and went to Chatham in Kent to join the Royal Engineers. Although this was a good position for Samuel, as his civil engineering background was very useful for the work in his regiment, there were rumours that the actual reason why he had left London so abruptly was because he had accumulated a number of debts that he was unable to pay. In 1869, he married a lady he had met while stationed in Wales. Her name was Lavinia Griffith. She already had four children, but Samuel married her and she accompanied him when he was posted overseas to Halifax in Nova Scotia in Canada. Their marriage was described as turbulence, as Samuel was a heavy drinker, but they remained married for 16 years. During this time, Samuel was known to court other women, and there were accusations by some that he had fathered their children. But whenever Samuel's wife questioned him on the allegations, he always denied them. Lavinia died unexpectedly in June 1885, and a somewhat shocked Samuel was granted leave. He returned to England, telling his colleagues that he wanted to visit his relatives. But his colleagues were all very surprised when he returned to Nova Scotia one month later with a young lady named Mary Boyd, who he introduced as his new wife. The marriage, however, was short-lived, as in October the same year, the unfortunate Mary became ill with stomach pains and died. The following year, Samuel got engaged to a local girl from Halifax named Bessie Steadman. She was a single mother and was pleased to be marrying a man who served in the Royal Engineers. She told her friends that Samuel could be a father figure to her child. In 1887, the regiment returned to England and Samuel and his wife settled in Aldershot. But she soon became disillusioned with his behaviour. He was aggressive, often drunk, and seemingly always talking to different women. So she packed her bags and along with her child, sailed back to Halifax. Samuel was now 41 years old. He left the army and with very little money, tried to find work. However, he never seemed to be able to keep any position for very long and drifted from job to job. He met a lady named Marion Payne and in 1889, they were given the opportunity to manage the Royston Crow pub in Ware in Hertfordshire. One night, the pub caught fire and burned down. The circumstances of the fire were strange and following an investigation, Samuel was charged with arson with intent to defraud the insurance company. The case against him, however, was hard to prove and after a short court case, he was acquitted. In 1892, Marion left him so Samuel decided to leave England and move to Dublin. He continued to tell anyone who would listen about his life in the Royal Engineers and soon became friendly with a 26-year-old lady named Sarah White. He would spend hours talking to Sarah and she seemed genuinely very fond of him. Eventually they got married and had two children, but Samuel found it difficult to find work in Ireland. He moved back to London without his wife. Here he had a chance meeting outside a bank with a lady named Emily Booty. He introduced himself as a widower and soon managed to charm his way into her home. He lived well, spending his new companion's money, but he missed Sarah. So once he was settled in Miss Booty's house, he arranged for his wife and children to come over from Ireland and join him. Unsurprisingly, Miss Booty did not agree with this arrangement and contacted the police, telling them that Samuel had stolen from her and had forged her cheques. He was charged and tried, 
but again he was acquitted by the court. However, in 1896, Samuel was eventually found guilty of something when he was caught forging cheques. He was sentenced to 12 months hard labour. The conviction was a big problem for him, as not only did he have to serve his time, but the guilty verdict also meant that he lost his army pension. When he was released, he reconciled with his wife and he found a job in Biggin Hill in Kent. For a while, his life seemed relatively normal, but he slowly became more aggressive and started drinking again. Eventually, fed up with her husband's attitude towards her, Sarah took the children and went back to Dublin. Despite his behaviour, Samuel was surprised that his wife had left him, but instead of continuing to work, he left his job and returned to London. However, Samuel's fortunes were about to change. In September 1898, he met a lady named Miss Camille Holland. Camille was somewhat naive, but was rumoured to have a large amount of money in savings and shares. Samuel managed to persuade the 55-year-old spinster that they should live together. Eventually she agreed and they set up home 50 miles north of London in the town of Saffron Walden. Here they were not known, so whenever they would meet anyone, Samuel would introduce Camille as Mrs. Dougal. Camille was very careful with money and kept a very tight control on her spending. She would not buy new clothes, preferring to mend the ones she already had. Her attitude towards money was very different to that of her free spending companion. While living in Saffron Walden, Samuel tried to persuade Camille to move to somewhere more remote. He spent hours looking at advertisements for houses for sale and eventually came across a small holding called Moat Farm, which was seven miles away in between the small villages of Clavering and Rickling. He took Camille to see the property. It was big and old and Camille did not really like it. She told him that it was too far from the village, but Samuel was very persuasive, and eventually, on the 19th of January, 1899, Camille purchased the property. Samuel told her that she should put the deeds in his name, but Camille told him that as she was paying for the property, the deeds to it would be in her name. Before the sale was finalised, they stayed in lodgings ran by a local lady named Mrs. Whiskin and finally moved into the farmhouse on the 27th of April, 1899. Once settled in the eerie old house, they employed a maid named Florrie Harris. But shortly after she started, she complained to Camille that Samuel had tried to seduce her. Camille confronted him about the allegation, but he dismissed it as a misunderstanding. Camille, however, believed the maid and the couple's relationship started to deteriorate. Samuel was getting very frustrated with Camille. He suggested that they make wills, leaving everything to each other, but she said that she already had a will and had no intention of changing it. She kept her money very close, not even letting Samuel have any to pay the wages. He started to think that he needed to rid himself of the tarsome lady and thought of ways in which he could do it. He practiced shooting in the coach house as he wanted to find out if anyone could hear him fire his revolver. But the farm was very remote and even though the noise of the shot was loud, no one lived near enough to hear the sound of gunfire. Friday the 19th of May was a very warm day and Camille went into the village with her little dog named Jacko. She returned in the afternoon and a few hours later, Samuel suggested that as it was such a pleasant day, they go out in the horse and trap. They were seen by some of the villagers who exchanged a greeting and the couple enjoyed a nice evening, returning to the farm at around eight o'clock. The next day, when the maid Florrie asked Samuel where Miss Holland was, he replied that she had gone to London. Having not heard from her mistress, Florrie left her employment at the farm. Samuel started to review his wife's papers. He was disappointed to learn that she was only worth around £7,000. Although more money than he had ever had, 
he was hoping that she might have been worth even more. What Samuel did next was quite remarkable. He wrote to his legal wife, Sarah, explaining his much changed circumstances. And a few weeks later, she joined him at Moat Farm. Mrs. Wiskin, Florrie Harris and other locals had noticed that they had not seen Miss Holland since the 19th of May. And when Sarah and the two children arrived, rumours started circulating around the village about the young lady who was living with Samuel. In order to quell the local gossip, the couple made up a story that Sarah was Samuel's daughter who had recently been widowed. No one really believed this and people started to question if anything had happened to Miss Camille Holland. For the next three years, Samuel lived the life of a country squire. He forged Camille's name on cheques and used the money to finance his lifestyle. He also set about getting his hands on Camille's assets and managed to transfer the ownership of Moat Farm into his name. But he continued to pursue women. Many maids started at the farm, but soon left due to the unwanted attention. And in January 1902, Sarah had had enough of his ways and left. The couple divorced in August the same year. A month later, the maid named Kate Cranwell resigned from her employment at the farm. She was heavily pregnant and started a paternity suit against Samuel. Two illegitimate babies were born in 1903 and baptised at the village church and everyone suspected that he had fathered them. And they also wondered why no one had seen or heard from Miss Holland for nearly four years. With all the rumours and the gossip, the police decided to pay Samuel a visit. They briefly searched the house and farm, but found nothing out of the ordinary. They did succeed, however, in making Samuel feel very nervous, and he immediately left and travelled to London. He returned a week later, but only stayed for one night before going back to London. Incredibly, he was joined by a young lady named Georgina Cramwell, the sister of the maid who had started legal proceedings against him, claiming he was the father of a child. Georgina was also pregnant. To stay in London, Samuel needed money, but for some reason, the next time he cashed one of Camille's cheques, he went to the Bank of England. He had previously only cashed them at local banks. This time, however, the cashier refused to cash it. The police were alerted and Samuel was taken to the police station where he was charged with forgery. When the Essex police learned of his arrest, they decided to conduct a thorough search of Moat Farm. So, on the 19th of March, 1903, a police team arrived. They searched the farm and the house. They looked under the floorboards and drained the moats, but there was no sign of Miss Camille Holland. The local people were so convinced that harm had come to the poor lady that they joined the police at the farm, bringing them sandwiches and cakes. Local and national news reporters also set up camp there, all wanting to report on the story of the lady that had not been seen for four years. On Monday the 27th of April, 1903, exactly four years since Camille and Samuel had moved onto the farm, the police considered calling off the search. They had been there for five weeks and it was taking up a lot of man hours without revealing anything. Then a police officer noticed Camille's little dog named Jacko whimpering on the side of the ditch. Everyone remembered how devoted she was to her dog, but no one had seen him since she disappeared. The ditch had been filled in and plants had been placed in the soil, but the police decided to dig. As they did, the little dog continued to whimper. They dug two metres, but found nothing. They discussed filling the ditch back in, but thought they would dig a little further. Suddenly, they noticed a woman's boot sticking out of the soil, and as they carefully dug, they unravelled a woman's body. The body was badly decomposed and was taken to a pathologist, who confirmed that the deceased had died from a single shot at close range. Identification was very difficult, but her former landlady, Mrs. Wiskin, 
and her nephew Ernest confirmed that the clothes and jewellery found on the body had indeed belonged to Miss Camille Holland. Samuel was then charged with her murder. The trial began on the 22nd of June 1903 at Shire Hall in Chelmsford and only lasted for two days. The police told the court that in their opinion on May the 19th 1899 the defendant and Miss Holland returned from their ride in the horse and trap and instead of going into the house Miss Holland stayed outside enjoying the evening air but as she stared at the night sky Samuel pulled out his revolver and shot her. He then dragged her into the coach house before removing one of her rings and burying her in the drainage ditch. He then spent the next four years spending her money and forging her cheques. The defence case was particularly weak and when the jury retired they only took 56 minutes to return with a verdict of guilty and the judge sentenced the defendant to death by hanging. A few weeks later, on the 14th of July, 1903, Samuel Herbert Dougal was hanged at Chelmsford Prison. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As per usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I will see you in the next brief case.